talk, last talk for today's session, so I'll try to keep it gentle. I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing a very beautiful conference. And uh, I'm a former student of Professor Ramulti, so I'm delighted to be talking uh, on the occasion of his 60th birthday conference. So uh, the theme of my talk would be, as, as was mentioned, uh, non-vanishing of certain L functions. So before I describe the exact problem I'm looking at, I'd like to uh, introduce some notation. And whatever I'm going to talk about today is a preliminary report of joint work with Henrik Ivanich. So I'm interested in HECA L functions so a brief review of notation let us take S sub K of Q to be equal to the space of cusp forms of weight K with respect to the modular group gamma sub zero of Q and this is a linear space it is also equipped with an inner product structure which is given by the Peterson inner product which is defined as so for any two elements in this space the Peterson inner product simply you take the quotient on the upper half plane f of z g of z bar y raised to the k dx dy over y square okay okay now for technical simplicity i'm going to assume that q is a prime and also because of the special importance of the case k equal to 2 let's restrict ourselves to that case Okay. And in this case, because of the fact that Q is prime, we know that the space is spanned by new forms of this level. Okay. So from now on, everything I do is restricted to new forms so let f and g denote new forms in s2 of q and the notation that we use for this would be f and g are elements of s2 star of q okay now for any new form we know that it has a Fourier expansion which we write in the following form n raised to the half times lambda sub f of n e raised to the 2 pi i x z okay where lambda f of 1 is equal to 1 okay and for n bigger than or equal to 1 this is less than or equal to tau of n by which we mean the number of positive divisors of n right. now this L function so now corresponding to f we look at the L function which we define as we take these normalized coefficients And consider the following infinite series okay and in the region of absolute convergence of this series this has a Euler product expansion which we write as follows 1 minus product runs over all the primes P over P to the S 
plus a certain quantity which is either 1 or 0 depending on what your prime is. So if P is equal to Q, then your epsilon sub Q of P is 0, otherwise it is 1. mentioning will come up. Oh yes, okay, thank you. I thought you were referring to this. <laughs> okay. All right. So this can be extended to an entire function and it also satisfies a functional equation. So if you define lambda f of s to be equal to root of q over 2 pi raised to the s times gamma of s plus half. The functional equation tells us that the above is exactly equal to a quantity which is plus or minus 1 times lambda of f comma 1 minus s where in fact to be more precise our epsilon sub f is exactly equal to minus lambda sub f of q times square root of q okay Okay, now if your epsilon f is minus 1, you observe, so in other words if f is what you call an odd form, then your lambda would have a 0, your LF, LFS would have a 0 at s equal to half. Okay, so the question that we ask, uh, the question that motivated us to look at generalizations was the following fundamental question. What is the order of vanishing of the L function at s equal to half? Okay. What can we say about R sub f which we define as order of vanishing this function at s equal to half. Okay. And since everyone has been quoting results of Professor Muldi, I will also do that. So it is expected that if your f is an odd form, this order is at most 1. In other words, the derivative does not vanish at s equal to half. And if f is an even form, then the order is expected to be just 0. In other words, your function does not vanish. More precisely, Blumen and Monti in 1995 independently stated the following conjecture that if you take, if you sum over all the new forms of level Q just one second and sum over the order of vanishing this is expected to be asymptotic to exactly half of the number of new forms in other words 
half of the dimension of the space S2 of Q. as q goes towards infinity and in the direction of this conjecture so this is a conjecture in the direction of this conjecture they prove the following result which states that the sum is in fact less than or equal to three halves so they find an upper bound plus little o of one times the dimension of s2 of q okay as q goes to infinity okay and they prove this theorem assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis for these L functions. Okay, so I looked at their papers and I found them very interesting. The key techniques, the key technique they use is the explicit formula, but while Bloomer uses the Eichler Selbert trace formula to prove this. Ramurthy uses the Peterson formula, that is his, uh, his, one of his main techniques to prove this. So when I started looking at their papers, the first question I asked was how can we go closer to the conjectured value and secondly what happens if we remove the GRH and I was uh, directed towards a paper by Michelle Kowalski and Van der Kam, where they answer this question. In fact, they find an upper bound, uh, a constant, which is better than three halves, and the result is unconditional. Okay, so. In 2008, they proved that the sum okay, I think you understand what I mean is less than or equal to 1.1891. This is their constant times the dimension. of the space okay so we will spend some time actually reviewing the fundamental ideas of the proof but before I do that I have to tell you why I'm going to do that why this is not entirely an expository talk so what they did in order to prove their result was answer a different question related to the order of vanishing so the first step, the key theorem in this paper is the following. They estimate the number of new forms okay, for which the epsilon number plus or minus 1 is equal to minus 1 raised to the k and the kth derivative does not vanish. And they were able for a uh, at half yeah. This does not vanish. They found that you can find a, a positive proportion of new forms for which the kth derivative does not vanish and they also found optimal uh, proportions. So into the okay. Well, 
So when we came, they give, they tell us what the values P sub k are. In particular, P0. Okay, so the proportion of new forms which don't vanish, for which the L function does not vanish, at half is 1 over 4 P sub 1, meaning the non vanishing of the first derivative is 7 over 8, and so on. And it is this key result which they combine with, with another average estimate. So, so they use this in order to prove the theorem that I mentioned above. Okay. So I was looking at their paper and I went through their method of proof and was trying to see if really these are the optimal constants and it, it does seem that these using the method that they use the, the constants that we get are quite optimal. So when thinking more about these papers, I happened to discuss it with Professor Kumar Murthy. I don't know if he remembers it, but he suggested a very interesting direction for research. He asked if, he asked if I could do uh, the analogs of these results for Rankine-Selberg L functions. Okay? So uh, I was at Berkeley, at MSRI Berkeley at that time and Ivan H was also around. So we started discussing this problem and the primary question that we decided to investigate was the proportion of F and G both new forms for which the ranking Selberg L function which I'll define immediately does not vanish to half. Now before uh, giving you details of this question, uh, we should spend some time discussing why this, this quantity is so important, why have so many people thought about it. Well, one of the primary reasons is that this analytic quantity has a very interesting algebraic interpretation. What is that? Well, if you look at the quotient of the upper half plane, the extended upper half plane by gamma naught of Q, this can be thought of as an abelian variety and we define J0 of Q to be equal to the Jacobian of this variety and by the model way theorem, so this, this, uh, you can think of this, this is also an abelian variety and therefore by um, an application of your model way theorem, this has finite rank and according to a special case of the Birchin, Swinnett and Dyer conjectures, the algebraic rank of this Jacobian should be equal to the analytic rank of the L function corresponding to J0 of Q. And what is that? So I and by Eichler and Shimura's work, we know we know that if you look at the Hassan way zeta function, of this Jacobian, is exactly equal to, it can be written in terms of 
L functions of mu forms. So, in fact, it turns out to be the product of the L functions where F run over the new forms of V2 and level Q. Okay, and therefore, this sum over here is simply the order of vanishing um, of the L function corresponding to the Jacobian at S equal to half and that's also that's that's one of the main reasons why we are so much interested in this quantity. Okay. Now coming back to the rank and side of L functions. We define them as follows. So this is equal to the product of a few infinite series. So first we take zeta sub q of 2s. What is this? This is simply the zeta function where you take all the Euler factors except for and uh, I hope it is clear that the way I am stating everything assumes that Q is a prime number. Okay, So times 1 minus lambda sub f of Q lambda sub g of Q over Q to the s inverse Okay, times the infinite series lambda sub f of n times lambda sub g of n okay. and this we denote the, the entire thing that's written above the coefficient of 1 over n to the s we denote by mu sub fg. Okay. Another thing is to just simplify the writing on the board. From now on I am going to use the notation lambda sub fg of n which is simply the product these two numbers. Okay, so what do we know about the Rankin-Selberg L functions? It is a well-known fact, I believe proved by Rankin himself, that these extend to entire functions except possibly for a simple pole at s equal to 1 if f is equal to g. Okay, And in 1969, Og derived the functional equation for the rankin selberg L functions which tells us that if you take, if you define lambda of f times g of s as q over 4 pi square raised to the s times gamma of s times gamma of s plus 1 times the rankin selberg L function. Okay. This whole thing turns out to be exactly equal to lambda of f times g 
at 1 minus s okay this is very important for us we will be using the functional equation okay so so the question that we are asking is the proportion of f and g for which the L function does not vanish at s equal to half and once again in order to be able to apply Peterson formula in a very natural way we are going to attach some harmonic weight to that proportion okay so what we are going to do is define omega sub f to be equal to 1 over 4 pi times the inner product of f with itself and we ask okay, by star I mean we are running over new forms okay for which omega sub f omega sub g okay. this is the sum that we will investigate okay. so uh, the idea to do this one of the key ideas is in fact very simple application of the cauchy schwarz inequality so what you do is let us go back to the original problem of lf at half okay and let us consider the following quantities let us take c1 of q to be equal to omega sub f times uh, so let, let us just take omega sub f such that this is non-zero okay and okay so um, this okay, so okay so let me So let me multiply these okay and let's take c2 of q to be equal to omega sub f times l square So clearly the contribution in these terms will only come from those f's for which lf half is not equal to 0. Let us denote um, sorry uh, yeah so let us take let, let me just denote this as L sub f okay okay so now observe if you if you just look at c1 of q for a minute just write this as square root of omega sub f times square root of omega sub f and consider this as a different term okay and apply your cauchy schwarz inequality to c1 q of whole square okay you will immediately see that c1 of q whole square is less than or equal to the quantity that we are after the sum times c1 
two of q. Okay, so in other words, if you can estimate c1 of q and c2 of q, you are very close to an answer to your question. So it turns out that your okay, this is greater than or equal to C one of Q whole square over okay, and if you could show that as q goes to infinity, this tends to some positive absolute constant, then you have answered your question. You have found a lower bound for this quantity over here. And we apply the same technique to the functions, the L functions, uh, the rankin selberg L functions. Okay, so let us take let us define L sub f of g to be equal to the Rankine-Selberg, the value of the Rankine-Selberg function at a half. Okay, and we do exactly the same thing. Okay, so what are the quantities that we need to estimate? Let's give them names. one of q okay so this is equal to the double sum okay. and e sub 2 of q is equal to Now, it is a result proved by Duke that as q goes to infinity, okay, by, by an application of your Peterson formula, Duke showed the following. He showed that our E1 of Q is asymptotic, so this behaves very nicely. You can find a fixed constant, so E1 of Q is asymptotic to C0 as Q goes to infinity, okay, and E2 of Q does not behave as well as we would like it to and so what he was able to show is that you can find some other constant but it's a multiple of log q okay and from this you immediately see that these two estimates will not give us what we are after right because as q goes to infinity e1 of q whole square over e2 of q will go to 0. Okay. So, in order to get rid of this log q, okay, what we do is we go back to these moments, the first and the second moments, and we apply a technique in analytic number theory known as the mollification technique. So, we multiply each constant with what you call a mollifier and then estimate this modified E1 and E2 and get absolute constants. Okay, so now coming back to our Rankine and Selberg L functions. Okay, I'll tell you in a minute how you mollify this, but let's start with a key step. Okay, so the first step, how much time do I have left? 
about 10 minutes. Okay. So what we do is, suppose you have a holomorphic function g of s, which is of polynomial growth in the region real part of s less than or equal to alpha plus some alpha bigger than 1. If you want, you can take alpha to be equal to 2. So take such a holomorphic function and look at the following integral. Let's take the integral of the following function along the line real part of s equal to alpha lambda of f times g at s plus half times g of s over s ds. Okay? Now, so since there are graduate students in the audience, you know that in order to estimate quantities like this, what do you do? You take alpha minus it to alpha plus it integrate this whole thing along a rectangular contour. So you shift, basically you shift the contour from alpha to something to the left of zero. Okay, let's say you shift it to minus alpha. Okay, and it so happens that the in that rectangular contour, as t goes to infinity, the contribution coming from the horizontal lines, horizontal part of the contour vanishes, and you are essentially left with the vertical part okay and so and the integral along that contour is equal to the sum of the residues so where on can this function have residue at s equal to zero and at s equal to half okay then so doing that shifting contour technique what we end up getting is that our lambda and we put some more restrictions on g of s okay we take let's say g of s is equal to g of minus s and some other restrictions about how it behaves at zero and half etc but after doing this uh, you end up getting for a suitably chosen g you get that this is equal to 2 times the contour integral over alpha and by the way you also use uh, when you are shifting from alpha to minus alpha you also use the functional equation for lambda okay so you end up getting times g of s over s ds okay and how will this help us well we already know what is this this is a product of the gamma function along with an infinite series the rankin selberg series so we put that into this equation interchange integration and summation and with a little bit of work, we get that our L sub f of g, in the value at s equal to half, is exactly equal to the following sum. It is equal to 2 times summation lambda sub f g of m l raised to the minus half a function w which I will define in a minute of n over q plus an error term contribution which is basically o of 1 over q but what is this w of n over q w of y is defined as the integral of a certain function 
which is a combination of our gamma functions coming from the functional equation along with the zeta function along the line alpha and h of s simply equal to gamma of s plus half product times zeta of 2s plus 1 and then there is some constant in the denominator times 2 pi raised to the 2s times okay I'm just going to write it in this way it helps make our other calculations more transparent this is your function h okay and from this you can see that this has a double pole at s equal to 0 okay so your h of s if you want to write the Laurent series expansion you have okay, you will see get 1 over 2 s square plus I leave it as an exercise for the students to figure out this quantity here. Okay. So let me now quickly in the time that remains, let me quickly indicate how this key step answers our question, helps us to estimate the mollified moments. So Let us choose the following modifier. Let us do the following. Let us say that this is equal to, let's say this sum terminates at some finite stage which depends on Q. So we take some small sufficiently, um, some sufficient power of Q. Okay, and we take mu of m over square root of m times 1 minus okay so let me define m sub f of g as this times lambda sub f of g at m okay and the estimate now First, the sum okay. and so this is a double sum and the second modified moment m square okay so now in the very first sum you end up getting so notice you have terms of the form lambda sub of g of l and when you write out l sub f of g you also get uh, so basically you are going to multiply lambda sub of g of m times lambda sub of g of sub l okay and some and take uh, certain sums so that's where you apply your Peterson formula okay and then you distinguish between the diagonal terms meaning those terms where m is equal to m and the non-diagonal terms so it's a I don't have time to do that calculation but what happens is that after you do that write it all out apply your Peterson formula and what you did in step one it turns out that this is asymptotic to one over theta minus one and then choose your capital m to be equal to some power of q 
okay so you so you end up getting this as q goes to infinity and e2 of q is a far more complicated calculation okay because now you'll see there are four terms of this form so in fact this the margin of this board is not sufficient for me to do for the calculation here but after a lot of work spending a few midnights doing this you end up getting the following term four over theta times the following infinite product depending on your primes one plus two p okay as q goes to infinity and thus you are able to estimate the non vanishing the proportion of non vanishing of your n function so this is bigger than or equal to e1 square of q and by the way here your theta can be anything strictly bigger than 0 and strictly less than 1 times theta over 4 times a certain product okay and you observe that this is less than 1 sorry yeah yeah thank you okay so this helps us to prove our theorem that the proportion of non vanishing is bigger than or equal to this quantity here some comments firstly we chose a very rough mollifier we just chose something that worked but this is certainly not an optimal mollifier so we are also looking at optimizing the mollifier in order to get better uh, a smaller a more optimal proportion and secondly we would also like to investigate we haven't done it so far but it is one of our goals to use this to see if we can estimate the following sum the order of vanishing okay so this would be the analog of the analytic rank of j not of q in the rank and cell bulk context and i hope that certainly we will be able to do it before professor kumar moti 60th birthday conference so thank you